So I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate everybody who came in to listen and is listening remotely. So I'm Glenn Berry. I work for SQL Skills for Paul, Randall, and Kimberly Tripp. And this presentation will be analyzing I/O subsystem performance. So just to get the marketing slide out of the way, there's a little bit more about me. That's our blog site. And I'm pretty active on Twitter. And I have a blog at SQL Skills and a personal blog. So you can look at that later if you really want to know all that stuff. So what I want to talk about today is really there's three main things you measure for storage performance. There's three main metrics. I'll talk about that. And then I'll show you some SQL Server I.O. workload metrics that you want to look at when you're analyzing your I.O. subsystem. Then I'll talk about some common tools that are free that you can use to test your storage subsystem. And I'll talk about some of the different storage types that are commonly used for SQL Server. And then how to choose storage for different workloads and file types and then a little bit about RAID levels and different SQL Server workloads and how those things are related. And then just show you some comparative storage metrics using Crystal Dismark. So the three main metrics for storage performance, the first one that everybody likes to talk about is latency, which is typically measured in milliseconds. Or if you've got a really fast system, it might be in microseconds or nanoseconds for some things. Then another thing that people talk about a lot is input-output operations per second, or IOPS. And those two are usually what most people talk about when they look at storage subsystems. But what's also really important, especially for SQL Server, is sequential throughput, which is typically going to be measured in megabytes per second or hopefully gigabytes per second on a fast subsystem. And those measurements are all related, so you can't just look at one and ignore the other ones. And that's what storage vendors tend to do. They will show the one that shows their system in the best light and not talk about the other two sometimes. So you don't want to make that mistake when you're looking at your I.O. subsystem. So latency is the first one. And that's just the time that it takes for an I.O. to complete. And it's sometimes called a response time or the service time, depending on what kind of a tool is measuring it and who you're talking to. But it starts when the OS sends a request to the drive, and it ends when you get back an acknowledgment that it's done processing the request. And the reads are complete when the OS is done receiving the data, and the writes are complete when the drive says that, I, OK, I've got the data. And it might still be in a cache, whether it's on the drive itself or on a RAID controller or someplace else where you've got some sort of cache. And one thing you want to look at really closely when you're looking at SQL Server is whether you're using write-back caching or write-through caching. Write-back caching is much, much faster, but it's a little bit more risky. Because if you don't have a battery backing up that cache, there's a possibility you could lose some data if the system went down. So you want to make sure that you've got a battery in your cache. And then if you do, which you should hopefully do have that for SQL Server, make sure you're using write-back caching instead of write-through caching. It's a huge difference in performance. The next one that people talk about a lot, especially people who are SAN vendors, is IOPS, input-output operations per second. And that's directly related to latency. So whatever your latency is, if you have, for example, a latency of one millisecond, that means you can process 1,000 IOs per second with a queue depth of one. And as you add more and more IOs to the queue, the latency tends to increase. And that's one reason why flash storage is much faster for IOPS, because it can read and write multiple things in parallel to the different NAND channels. So that's one reason why it's so much better for IOPS. So IOPS is basically the queue depth divided by the latency. And it doesn't tell you by itself what the transfer size is, which makes a big difference when you're looking at SQL Server. So you need to know what the transfer size is when somebody throws an IOPS figure at you. So you can basically translate IOPS to megabytes per second and megabytes per second to latency as long as you know the queue depth and the transfer size. So here's an example. Well, actually, I wish you want to go on to sequential throughput. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about sequential throughput because it's so important for SQL Server, just the daily things we do as a DBA. But it's usually going to be megabytes per second on most people's systems. But if you've got a fast system, it'll be gigabytes per second. And it's basically just the IOPS times the transfer size gives you the megabytes per second. So for example, 292 megabytes per second might be 71,000 IOPS with a 4K transfer size. And of course, SQL Server uses an 8K transfer size, but a lot of the tools out there use 4K. And a lot of the benchmark results you'll see and vendor claims will say 4K on the transfer. So 
Anyway, sequential throughput quite often gets shortchanged in enterprise storage because you've got bandwidth limitations from the storage interface that's going to be a bottleneck here. So the most common one that hopefully is not as common as it used to be is people using uh, iSCSI NICs where they're using one gigabit uh, NICs that are, just have about 100 megabytes per second of sequential throughput. And that's really pretty pathetic. That's worse than a laptop hard drive. And, but a lot of enterprise systems up until the last year or two still were using those. And then another common thing you run into is somebody's running a, a fiber channel SAN with a 4 gigabit HBA. And that's going to be limited to about 400 megabytes per second. And sequential throughput is really, really important for SQL Server because it comes into play for things such as database backups and restores. If you want to go create a new index or rebuild an index, or if you're doing something like a big, large reporting type query against a data warehouse, things of that nature are going to be bottlenecked by your sequential throughput. And especially SAN vendors don't like to talk about sequential throughput because a lot of their SANs have problems with that. They do really well on IOPS and okay on latency, but pretty bad on sequential throughput, for example. So you know, again, the importance of sequential throughput is the things that you're doing as a DBA that affect your daily uh, life are so important that you have good sequential throughput. So, again, a full database backup or restore relies on sequential throughput. And there's some things you can do to try to get the most sequential throughput and the best I.O. performance from your system. So, make sure if you haven't already done it that you've granted the perform volume maintenance task right to the SQL Server service account because that lets it skip the step of zeroing out uh, the space in a data file after it's allocated. And that can make a huge difference on how long it takes to do a backup, for example. And also, you want to make sure to use backup compression, whether it's the native backup compression in SQL Server or a third-party tool. That can really reduce your I.O. utilization at the cost of a little bit more CPU, which usually you have CPU to give. You also want to make sure you keep your VLF, your virtual log file counts, under control because that can affect the right performance to your log file and it also has a big effect on how long it takes to restore a database backup or even fail over in a cluster from one node to another. This can really be affected by if you have really high VLF counts or not on your databases. And sequential throughput really comes into play if you're going to go build an index on a great big table or rebuild an existing index. You know, and, and it really gives you a lot more freedom as a DBA. If you know that it only takes you a few minutes instead of an hour or two to create an index, you're more likely to try different indexes to see if you can get better performance. Whereas if you know, well, no, it's going to take two hours to create this index on this large table, you're much more hesitant to do it. So when you are going to do index creation, make sure you think about what you set your max stop at for the index create statement because you can use that to sort of throttle the index creation process and not put as much of a load on your system. And also you want to think about using data compression if it's appropriate and if you have enterprise edition because that can make a huge difference on how much I.O. you're using. And then finally with data warehouse type large sequential reporting queries if it doesn't fit into your memory in your buffer pool, then of course sequential throughput is just key to how long it's going to take to service that query. And unfortunately, the new buffer pool extensions feature that's in SQL Server 2014 doesn't help very much for sequential reads. I really wish that there was a tuning option where you could make it work better for that because I could see it helping a lot on some really slow SANs, but unfortunately Microsoft doesn't let it work that way. So going on, some of the things you want to look at with SQL Server for I.O. workload metrics is you want to have an idea is what is the read versus the write ratio of your workload from an I.O. perspective. And I've got some queries in my DMV diagnostic queries set that help you determine that in a very exact fashion. And that's going to be different for the different file types. So for your data files and your log file and your tempdb files, you can look at the read-write ratio and get an idea. Is it more of an OLTP workload? or more of a reporting workload or some more of a hybrid workload. And it's really important to know that when you're thinking about your I.O. subsystem. So you want to look at what are the typical I.O. rates in terms of IOPS and throughput for your existing workload. And you can look at Perfmon and you can see the reads per second and the writes per second 
Well, that's IOPS, and you can see that for individual files. And then disk read bytes per second and disk write bytes per second is throughput. And then you can also look at the average logical disk level latency by looking at average disk seconds per read and average disk seconds per write in Perfmon. That's latency. And then you can use one of my diagnostic queries to get a file level IO latency. So you can figure out in milliseconds what the typical latency is for a particular data file or a particular log file for both reads and writes. And what, what can you do to actually, <coughs> excuse me, measure your IO performance with different tools in Windows and SQL Server? <coughs> excuse me. Well, Task Manager in Windows Server 2012 and newer, depending on what kind of storage you're using, will actually show you some of these metrics right in Task Manager. So that's kind of nice. And then you can go and to Windows Resource Monitor and look at the disk section and get information on individual files. And I like to do this a lot when I'm doing something like creating an index or watching a backup to see what's happening with the individual files, and what's happening with the megabytes per second that are being read or written, and then the latency while it's actually happening. You can actually really get a good education about what's happening by watching that in real time. You can also pull up the logical disk counters in Perfmon. I mentioned a few of them on the previous slide. And then there's three disk benchmark tools that are really useful, and they're all free. The first one is Crystal Disk Mark, and that one is used a lot. It's sort of the easy one, and the URL is right there. And then SQL I.O. has been around for a number of years. It's a little bit more complicated and time-consuming to run. And then there's a new tool that just came out last year called Disk Speed that's sort of SQL I.O. on steroids. It's much more powerful, and the URL for it is right there. And then my DMV diagnostic queries, if you run those, there's a number of I.O. specific queries. I'm going to show you a few of those in a few slides. I'm going to do a demo and show a bunch of those. So here's what it looks like in Windows Server 2012 or newer in Task Manager. And again, depending on what kind of storage you're hooked up to, you may or may not see this. But if you've got a local drive, you're going to see something like this for each drive. And you can see some metrics about the drive in real time. Then the disk performance section and resource monitor, you can look here and see for individual files what the reads are and what the writes are and then what the response time in milliseconds is. And again, this is while you're doing this, it's just gathering evidence about how your system is running. So when you talk to your SAN administrator or storage administrator, you've got all sorts of evidence about what's going on with your IO subsystem. Going on, here's the most important logical disk counters in Perfmon. And so I usually filter it down to just these ones and, and then watch this over time. And then, of course, you can write this to a file to see what's going on for trending purposes. So I'm going to jump out of the PowerPoint just briefly and run through a subset of my diagnostic queries that are sort of related to I.O. performance and what's going on with your system and from an I.O. perspective. So and this script will be available on my blog after this, so don't worry about that. So the first one I like to run on a system is DBCC trace status negative one, and it gives me all the global trace flags that are enabled on this instance. And some of these are I.O. related, so that's why I wanted to include this here. The first one that I think everybody should have turned on, there's really no downside to it, is trace flag 1118, and that helps get you more even usage of all your tempdb data files. And I think that should be enabled. There's really no downside to doing it. The next one that I like to have enabled on most people's system is 3226. And it's not really I.O. related, but it doesn't, it suppresses logging of successful database backup messages to the SQL Server error log file. And it just helps keep less useful information out of that file. And then the other one that I like to have turned on for most people is 2371, and that lowers the auto update statistics threshold for really large tables. They added that feature to help people soft workloads, but it can help some people get better query performance and, and indirectly benefit the I.O. subsystem. So going on, the next one in this set, I just want to have an idea of what kind of hardware and how much memory I have on the box. So this tells me I've got 32 gigs of RAM on my desktop here. And I've got a single processor that's a quad core with hyper-threading, so I have eight logical CPUs. 
And then it also tells me how long SQL Server has been running. And that's really important for analyzing some of the other queries that you might look at later on. The next one, I want to find out how is SQL Server license and how many cores do I have here. So this tells me that I've got one socket that's a quad core and then it has hyper threading so it sees eight logical processors. And I want to understand that when I'm thinking about the system. The next one is I want to know what kind of processor I have because that's going to indirectly affect my I.O. capabilities. So I've got a Core i7-3770K here in my particular desktop. It's a couple years old. It's not top of the line anymore. So going on, I want to find out some of the configuration options for the instance. So when I run this query, this shows me, okay, backup compression default is turned on, which I think is a good thing. Cost threshold for parallelism set to the default, and usually on a production system, I would probably raise this a little bit. Max degree of parallelism set to zero, and usually I want to change that. We usually tell people to set it to the number of physical cores in a NUMA node to start with. And then max server memory is set to 27,000 megabytes, which is roughly appropriate for a 32 gig system. And optimized for ad hoc workloads is enabled, and I think that should always be turned on. Going on, I want to find out, is buffer pool extensions turned on on my system? And it is. So if you don't, are not familiar with this feature, it's a new feature for 2014 where you can set aside some space to use for read-only caching. And you're supposed to use flash storage, although Microsoft doesn't make you do that. You can put this on a thumb drive if you were stupid. But what this is designed to do is, the idea is if you've got a relatively slow I.O. subsystem that doesn't do very well for random uh, read I.O. and you set aside some space on a flash drive, then you could get better read I.O. performance for random reads from that flash storage device where you're using some space there. So I've got this enabled on my system. And then if you have it enabled and if you've actually used it enough, you might see some results here. And I don't, though. I have it enabled, but I haven't hit my system hard enough since I rebooted it this morning to actually get some usage. But this should show you which databases were using that VPE file. Going on, I want to get an idea where I have my database files spread across my I.O. subsystem. So this is going to show me each file for each database and where it lives and what kind of a file it is. And then it's going to tell me some things about the files, such as whether percent growth is turned on, which is a bad thing, what the growth setting is set to, and then what the size of the file is. So this gives me an idea that, okay, I've got a C drive and an L drive, and I've got things spread across those somewhat here. And that's going to vary on everybody else's system. Okay, the next thing I want to find out is what volumes do I have that are SQL Server related where I have database files? and how big are they and how much space do they have. So I've got a C drive and an L drive in my desktop. And this is how big they are. They're both SSDs. And that's how much space I have available. And having space available is important both for conventional magnetic storage, since you get the benefit of short stroking. And it's also important for flash storage, because as you run low on space, you're going to have a harder time doing garbage collection and trims and things like that. So your performance tends to go downhill as you get closer to being full, even on flash storage. So moving on, I want to look for 15-second I.O. warnings in the SQL Server error log. And hopefully I don't have any on my desktop. But on many production systems, especially with poor I.O. performance, you'll get a message in your SQL Server error log every time that it's more than 15 seconds, which is a long, long time to service an I.O. request. And if you get any results back from this, that's really good evidence that you might have some I.O. problems. And it's good evidence to take to your SAN administrator when they tell you that everything's fine with the SAN. So going on is a query that I took from Jimmy May and modified it a little bit. But what this does is it gives us the drive level latency for all the drives in the system where I have SQL Server database files. And this is cumulative since SQL Server has started and includes everything that's touched those files. So your normal workload, backups, index maintenance, anything that's touched those files is going to affect these numbers. And this number is quite high right there. And the reason for that is after I started my system, 
I ran some benchmarks and did some things to really slam one of the databases on this uh, instance. So that's why you're seeing such a high number there. And if I saw that in real life, that would be pretty poor performance. So going on, after you do it at the drive level, you can do it at the file level. This query here goes down to individual files, and it shows you the average read stall in milliseconds for each of your database files, and your average write stall, and then the average across them. And then it shows you how big the file is and where it's located. And then going over here, it tells you things such as the number of reads and the number of writes. So this helps you figure out that, oh, I'm seeing lots and lots of reads and very few writes against this data file for this database. And that would tell me that, hey, that looks like a reporting workload, for example. And you can do this across all of your database files. So again, this is evidence that this particular data file for this database was seeing really high read latency. Okay, moving on. I want to find out what my VLF counts are for all my databases. And VLF, again, stands for virtual log file. And this is something every time a log file grows, for any reason, it adds more VLFs. And getting above about 200 is where I, I don't want to be above 200 unless you have a really, really large log file. But when you get into the tens of thousand range, that can have a huge effect on how long it takes to recover a database, how long it takes to fail over a node and a failover cluster, and also hurt your write performance to your log file. So going on here, this is going to show me which databases actually are using the most I.O. on my system since it's been running. So you can see this no compression test database is taking the lion's share of the I.O. and that's how much I.O. has been generated against it, almost 51 gigabytes worth, and then the percentage. Next I want to run the infamous cumulative top weight types query. And the reason I say infamous is that People will run this and then sometimes lose their minds because whatever comes back as a top weight type may or may not be a problem and they may or may not do the right thing based on this. But what this is showing is I've only had my system running a couple hours this morning and I've been purposely slamming the I.O. subsystem. So, of course, my top weight type is page I.O. latch shared, which is an I.O. related weight. And that may or may not mean that you have I.O. problems but it's just one piece of evidence as you're gathering all these metrics and analyzing your system. So the other problem with this query is that there's about 700 different weight types. And I try to filter out all the ones up here in red that we think are what are called benign weights. But if your system is running well and nobody's complaining, then you shouldn't lose sleep and spend hours worrying about what the top weight type is. That's one issue. And then the other problem is that there's a lot of bad information on the internet where you'll see what your top weight type is and you'll do a Google search on that and it comes back and tells you to do something. And that may or may not be correct. So just be careful and think about what you want to do here when you see these weight types. But this is just telling me that it lo looks like my top weight type was I.O. related. So moving on, I would want to run this next query multiple times at different times of the day and just multiple times over and over and see what my average task counts were across all my schedulers, my average runnable task counts, and then for us today, this one, the average pending disk I.O. count. If I run that multiple times, I want to see that zero. But if I see it one or five or anything above zero, then that's more evidence that the system is waiting for I.O. on a regular basis. And that's just another piece of the puzzle that, oh, yeah, we've got some I.O. problems that we might need to address, either by tuning the workload or improving the hardware. The next one that's somewhat related to I.O. is page life expectancy. And you can see this goes up as I run it because nothing's really happening on my system while I'm talking here. But this is the number of seconds the data stays in the buffer pool before it gets flushed to disk. And you want this to be higher rather than lower. But don't get sidetracked by you run it once and then you think you have a problem or you think you're fine. You want to watch the trend and see what you, your low range and your high range is at different times of the day and different days of the week to see what's going on with this. But if you are under memory pressure, then you're going to have I.O. pressure since data has to be flushed out of memory and written to disk more often. 
So then finally, I believe this is the last one of this short set, this is going to focus on the I.O. statistics for the current database for each file. So it's going to show you the number of reads and the number of writes for each one of the files, and then information about the stalls and the percentage of reads and writes. So again, this helps you characterize your workload to figure out is it more of an OLTP or more of a reporting kind of a workload. All right, so we're going to go back into the PowerPoint now. And we'll be on slide 15. So, you know, after you run all these queries and you're going to have all this information coming back, here's some of the things that I often see when I have people run these on their systems. It's really common to see very high write latency to TempDB data files. So what you want to do there is the first thing is make sure you've got multiple data files but I tell people to start with four or eight data files. Don't go out and create one data file for each processor core. That's sort of outdated guidance. Bob Ward from Microsoft has done a lot of testing and written multiple blog posts and presented at pass about this subject. But four to eight is a good starting point, and then you want to measure and see if you're seeing any allocation contention. You also want to make sure you're using that trace flag 1118. And then think seriously about using local flash-based storage for TempDB. If you've got SQL Server 2012 or newer and you're using failover clustering, you can use local flash storage on each node for TempDB, and that can make a huge difference in a lot of scenarios because it takes the TempDB load off of your SAN and you get better performance from that local flash storage than your SAN can give you. It's also very common to see high read latency from your user database data files. And if you see that, you want to look for any signs of memory pressure. And if you see any signs of memory pressure, such as low page life expectancy or memory grants pending or high, then you want to think about adding more RAM. RAM is really cheap, 10 to $12 per gigabyte. And you also want to look at just doing some standard workload and index tuning, you know, going in and adding one index could have a huge effect on this. And then you want Think about using a BPE and if you have 2014, and it's in standard edition, which is a big surprise, but it can help in this scenario sometimes. You also just want to start to gather as much evidence as possible about what's going on in your system so you can take all this and show it to your SAN administrator because a lot of times the overall SAN metrics look really good, and the SAN administrator says, I don't see a problem. Everything looks like it's running fine. So you need to have as much data as you can to show that, well, maybe the SAN is fine, but SQL Server is showing all these different indications that it's having I.O. subsystem problems. And keep in mind that the SysDM I.O. virtual file stats are cumulative since the instance was started. So if your instance has been running for two or three months, just take that into account. And they're going to include everything that's happened against your database files since the instance has been running. Now, Crystal Dismark is a free tool that was written in Japan. And it can be used to measure your storage in just a few minutes per uh, LUN. It's really quick and easy to use. It has just a few configuration options to worry about, but they're very simple. And you want to make sure to test with a 4,000 megabyte test file instead of the default 1,000 megabyte because that's going to minimize the influence of any hardware cache you might have in place. You also want to make sure to do at least five test runs because that's going to reduce the chance of any kind of an outlier skewing the results. And you also want to test with a, a random and a non-random test file because random data is not compressible where non-random data is compressible. And some SSD controllers, although not very many, use write compression to get better write performance. And so you need to think about whether or not you're using data compression, for example, or backup compression. Because if it's already compressed by the software, the hardware-based compression is not going to work as well. And that's going to affect the results you see on your testing and in real life. And you can multiply the 4K random I.O. results that you get by 244. And that's going to give you the IOPS result. And you can also hover the tooltip over the 4K and 4K QDEP32 to see the IOPS results. And then there's another little trick that I didn't know until a few months ago that when you get the graphical results back, you can control C from the GUI and then paste it in the notepad and you'll get the full detailed results.
So here's what the GUI looks like. And the top line here of sequential is what you want to worry about for sequential, obviously. And you know, things like backups and building indexes. And then the bottom line, 4K random for a queue depth of 32, is what you want to worry about for SQL Server type workloads. And you'll find that flash storage does much, much better on this compared to magnetic storage. It's a huge difference. The difference on sequential is not that big. It's only about two to three times higher typically. And here's what it looks like when you paste it in a notepad. You get all the details about the tests and all the results. And it's a little bit easier to deal with this than that previous screenshot, but it's that same test. Going on, SQL I.O. is another tool you can use after you run Crystal Dismark. Because at Crystal Dismark, you can run it in four or five minutes and you're done for each line. But this one can take many hours to do a complete round of testing. And despite the name, it doesn't require or even use SQL Server for its testing. It just lets you stress your I.O. system and see what it does when it's under stress. And it has lots and lots of configuration options and it can take a long time to run a full, complete suite of tests. And also, it can be pretty dangerous. If you run this on a shared SAN, you can bring the entire SAN to its knees. So you need to be careful about how you use this tool. And you can use the old-style DOS command prompt, or you can use PowerShell to run SQL I.O. tests. And there's a really good reference on how to use SQL I.O. and use PowerShell to drive it right here. Going on, this is a new tool disk speed and it's came out just last year and it's a lot more flexible and a lot more powerful than SQL IO and you can use command prompt or PowerShell to run these tests so here's a couple example uh, command line prompts or PowerShell prompts to run here and here's a really good reference from Jose Barreto on how to use this tool and then I want to move on to talk about the five primary storage types that our SQL Server commonly uses. So the first one is internal drives, then you have direct attached storage, then you have storage area networks, and then you have people using internal PCIe flashcards, and then SMB file shares. If you have a new enough version of Windows and a new enough version of SQL Server, this is a very attractive option that's getting more popular now. So internal drives especially with flash drives, it can be more than adequate for a lot of workloads. And modern 2U servers quite often can have up to 28 internal drives if they're two and a half inch drives. And having many small drives is much better than a few large drives for performance with magnetic storage. It's different with flash storage since larger drives tend to perform much better than smaller drives from the same model and family. But the size of the server in terms of whether it's a 1U or 2U or larger is going to have an effect on how many drive bays you have available. And if you are going to use internal drives, it's really important that you get the very best hardware RAID controller you can get for that server because the better RAID controllers have much faster processors and larger cache sizes and they're less likely to be a bottleneck for magnetic or more importantly for flash drives. And if you're going to be using anything like RAID 5 or RAID 50 or RAID 6 that's parity based, it's really good or really important, I should say, to have a really fast RAID controller so it doesn't become a bottleneck. Now, direct attached storage is going to be an external storage enclosure with multiple drive bays. So typically we're talking 14 to 24, two and a half inch drives in a single enclosure. And you want to try to dedicate at least one RAID controller to each storage enclosure. And in some cases, I've seen people use two RAID controllers for one storage enclosure because you don't want the RAID controller to be a bottleneck. And you don't want to daisy chain these either. And the storage enclosure should have dual power supplies and they should have multiple cables, SAS cables going to each host so you don't have a problem with redundancy. And it's really easy to configure and manage a direct attached storage device. It doesn't require any special training or expertise. You don't have to go to SAN school. And it does require some planning and common sense because it's harder with some direct attached storage devices to make changes after you set it up. It's not quite as flexible as a SAN. And you can build a system with really, really good sequential read and write performance with direct attached storage. And ultimately, you're going to be limited by your PCIe slot bandwidth and then your RAID controller performance. But you can get 
really good sequential performance from direct attached storage. Now, with direct attached storage, again, make sure to use one dedicated RAID controller per storage enclosure, or maybe even two. Use the best RAID controller you can get, and then make sure that the hardware cache on the RAID controller is actually enabled. For some reason, with Dell, for example, if you use the Dell OMSA system administration tool and you set up a RAID array with that, by default, the cache will not be enabled. And I've seen many, many customers where they've been running that way for years and didn't realize it. They went out and bought a good RAID controller with two gigabytes of cache and it wasn't even enabled. So make sure that it is enabled. And then you want to use write-back caching if it supports it, if it has a backup battery. And you also want to make sure that you try to dedicate the hardware RAID controller cache to writes rather than reads for most workloads, which usually means disable read-ahead caching because the SQL Server buffer pool is a much better read cache than your one gigabyte RAID controller is, for example. And you want to try to dedicate that cache to writes if you have that flexibility. Now, storage area networks is a shared enclosure that has multiple components. So you can have anywhere from dozens to hundreds of drive bays. You've got storage processors, a really big cache, its own operating system. And the initial cost of a SAN is going to be much, much higher than direct attached storage. And then it also is going to require some training and expertise to actually manage and run a SAN efficiently. And a lot of people just don't have that unless they've had some training. And of course, my joke I always say is that a SAN comes with a cranky SAN administrator for no extra charge. But in all seriousness, that can be a problem where the SAN administrator has different priorities than the DBA, and there's often conflict between the two, and you want to try to work around that if you can but there's two main types of SANs. You've got fiber channel SANs with host bus adapters and then iSCSI SANs that use Ethernet cards. And SANs are usually optimized for IOPS and their sequential throughput can be limited by what kind of HBA or what kind of NIC they're using or what kind of switches might be between your host and the SAN itself. SAN administrators, again, even though the SAN administrator might be making your life difficult as a DBA, you want to try to become their friend and communicate with them and let them know what kind of workload you have. You know, it's a SQL Server workload, it's an OLTP workload, you need this kind of SLA. But don't just say, well, I need five terabytes of space on the SAN. You want to go into much more detail than that. And just keep in mind that They've got different priorities than you because they've got multiple servers with different workloads. They've got to worry about running low on space and going to the CIO to get more SAN space, which is very expensive. And then they've got to worry about all SDBAs complaining about the performance on the SAN. So have some sympathy for the SAN administrator. And when you're looking at a SAN, Think about the complete data path from the HBA through the switches, through the SAN ports, and make sure there's not something in the middle, such as a lower capacity or throughput switch that's artificially limiting your throughput. And then despite all this, just you have to be prepared for inconsistent performance on a shared SAN. You can run benchmarks almost back to back and get different results because the SAN is doing so many different things and servicing other hosts. And SANs are not magic. You know, the SAN vendors and the SAN salesperson will tell you all these magical things that the SAN is going to do for you, but the details of the hardware inside the SAN actually still matter. And SANs are typically going to be throughput limited, which is bad for SQL Server in my opinion. Now, PCIe flash storage is going to be flash-based storage on a PCIe expansion card that just fits in one of your PCIe expansion slots. And that gets you around that SAS or SATA port limitation. And the latest products that have come out over the last year use non-volatile memory express, NVMe, to have really, really good performance with very low latency. And when you're using these kinds of products, you want to make sure you pay attention to what kind of PCIe slot you're dealing with, whether it's PCIe 3.0 or 2.0 or hopefully not 1.0 and then how many lanes you have. That's what the X16 or X8 or X4 talks about. That's going to have an effect on the total throughput that the entire slot can support. And you can plug in a higher end 
card and actually have more throughput in the card than the slot and support, and that can be a, a huge problem. These things can give you really, really good I.O. performance. We're talking up to nearly seven gigabytes per second, not gigabits, but gigabytes per second of sequential throughput from a single card. And you can also go over a million IOPS on a single card. And the more affordable ones are more around uh, two gigabytes per second of sequential throughput. But anyways, the capital costs on these range from fairly low now to extremely high for the absolute high-end ones, over $100,000 for one card. And it's very common when you're going to use these to use two of them together with software RAID 1 and Windows so you have some redundancy because they can fail and the slots they're in can fail. And one advantage of these cards is they use a lot less electrical power than having multiple magnetic drives so that can save a lot on your electric costs and your cooling costs and save rack space in your data center. So here's the PCIe slot bandwidth limits that I talked about just a minute ago. If you've got a really old system, and by really old I mean four, five, six years old, you might be dealing with PCIe 1.0. And If you had a four-lane slot, that entire slot could be limited to 750 megabytes per second for the slot. So that could be a big problem if you threw a PCIe flash storage card in there, or even a good RAID controller. And then where you want to be is PCIe 3.0. And that gives you much, much more sequential throughput. But unfortunately, so far, only newer Intel processors support that. So if you've got a Xeon E5 or newer, or a Xeon E7 V2 or newer, you have that. But anything else, so anything from AMD or anything older from Intel is not going to have PCIe 3.0 support. So the last kind of storage that I want to talk about briefly is SMB file shares, so server message block. And if you've got Windows Server 2012 or newer, and you have SQL Server 2012 or newer, you can actually create file shares and have your data files for both user and system databases on these file shares. And you can do this with any kind of hardware you want, but if you just use garden variety gigabit ethernet, you're not going to get super good performance. You know, you need to have something that supports RDMA, and you also want to have hopefully something like an InfiniBand connection so that you're going to get really good high bandwidth, low latency performance. And Microsoft, Jose Barreto, he works on a storage team there on the Windows Server team, has a lot of really good information about this on his blog, including how to set up a test lab and how to do all sorts of good testing to see how this works. And this is really common in the virtualization world but it's only starting to come to SQL Server, and there's full support for it in the product now. So this is an alternative to using a SAN. You can set up some file servers with this kind of hardware and get much better than SAN performance for failover clustering, for example. So here's something to keep in mind if you're thinking about this, is that you need to make sure that you've got Windows Server 2012 or newer on both sides of the connection here. So your SQL Server box, and then your remote file server that you're going to do an SMB file share has to be on these new versions of the OS. So if you've got an older SQL server talking to a brand new file server, you're not going to get SMB 3.0 or better here, which is what you need to make this work properly. All right, so next I want to talk about how do you look at your workload from a storage perspective. And SQL Server has three main common workload types. We've got OLTP, we've got relational data warehouse reporting type workloads, and then we've got OLAP workloads. And they've got different I.O. access patterns. Uh, an OLTP workload is going to have lots of writes to the data files and lots of sequential writes to the log file. And then you can have a lot of random reads from the data files if the database doesn't fit into your buffer pool. So that makes random I.O. performance very important for OLTP workloads. Whereas a data warehouse workload has large sequential reads from the data files, especially if it doesn't fit into the buffer pool. So sequential I.O. performance is very, very important for data warehouse kind of workloads. And then OLAP typically has lots of random reads from the cube files. So random I.O. performance is very important for that kind of a workload. So again, think about your workload when you're thinking about your storage subsystem. RAID levels and SQL Server workloads. Well, you need to think about your workload type 
because that's going to affect your desired RAID level. You know, RAID 10, non-parity-based RAID levels are better for write-intensive workloads, and they're also more robust. So you need to think about your availability requirements. Some RAID levels, such as RAID 10, is more robust than RAID 5, and RAID 50 is sort of in between the two. And the different types of workloads are going to have different I.O. patterns depending on what's happening with your system at a given time. So the percentage of reads and writes, whether it's sequential reads or sequential writes in the same way for uh, reads, that has an effect on what's going to go on with your I.O. subsystem. And then your different file types have different I.O. patterns. So data files, depending on the workload, are going to see either lots of reads or lots of writes. Same way for log files and tempdb and then backup files. And just being aware of this by looking at all those metrics that you can get from perfmon and my DMV queries helps you analyze and design your I.O. subsystem properly. So selecting a RAID level for your SLA requirements, RAID is not a substitute for a good backup and restore plan, no matter what anybody in your organization tells you. I've had people who were my bosses in the past tell me things like, well, we're using RAID 5, so you don't need to do SQL Server backups. And that's absolutely wrong. No matter what kind of RAID you're using and what else you have in place, you need to do backups and have a good restore plan. Having RAID in place is also not a substitute for an HADR strategy, no matter what any vendor tells you. And it, you know, all RAID does is it reduces the chance of unplanned downtime from losing one or more drives in, array, in an array. That's all it does. And RAID 10 and RAID 50 are the most robust common RAID levels. RAID 5 is really not that robust. You can only lose one disk in an array before you lose the entire array. And as you have more and more disks in a RAID 5 array, the statistical chance that any one of those disks will fail goes up. So higher numbers of disks make the array less reliable. And so it's a good idea to think about using hot spares in your disk arrays and maybe even having a cold spare available. So if you do lose one, you can immediately throw another one in there and then worry about RMAing the bad disk instead of having to worry about losing a second disk before you get a replacement. So choosing storage types based on your workload type. Flash-based storage is going to give really great random I.O. performance. That's where it really shines. And it also gives you better sequential performance than magnetic storage, but the difference is not nearly as much. Flash-based storage is still the most expensive per gigabyte, but the cost is coming down pretty dramatically. And if you looked at it maybe two or three years ago and had sticker shock, oh, we can't afford flash storage, you should look again. And you also want to look at flash storage from vendors such as Intel rather than looking at what the uh, server vendor wants to sell you because the pricing difference can be huge. You can get flash storage for about the same price as 15K magnetic storage now if you know where to look. Now magnetic storage gives fair sequential performance, but it gives quite bad random I/O performance compared to flash storage. And having a large cache on your RAID controller, for example, can help mask the poor random I.O. writes. So it's, that's why it's so important to have a good RAID controller. And then you can also use flash-based caching to help improve magnetic storage performance. But it's usually better to use caching rather than tiering. You know, a lot of storage vendors talk about tiering and where they try to move the hotter data to flash and that works pretty well for file servers, but not as well for SQL Server. It's usually better to use caching rather than tiering for SQL Server workloads. So flash-based storage is the best choice if you have the budget. And if you have heavy random I.O., whether it's reads or writes, flash-based storage is also going to be your best choice. And basically, if you've got any kind of an I.O. bottleneck, flash storage may be able to help, but it's not you know, a panacea. It's not going to just solve all your problems. And you may not have the budget to do flash storage anywhere, anywhere, anyways. So thinking about configuring your storage for the different kind of file types in SQL Server, for your data files, it's still very common to use magnetic storage because usually you need a lot of space for your data files, and you may not have the budget to do that with flash. But as the cost is coming down, it's becoming more popular. And it's most common to use RAID 5 
or RAID 50 and not as much RAID 10 for data files, but sometimes you see that. Now for log files, it's still fairly common to use magnetic, or, but I see flash becoming more popular. It's quite common to use RAID 10 or something that's just not parity based for your log files since they're so write intensive with a lot of workloads. And then tempdb, it's still common to use magnetic storage, but I see a lot more people moving to flash storage now. And it's common to use RAID 10 there rather than something like RAID 5. And then for backup files, magnetic storage is what most people use, and most people use RAID 5 or RAID 50 for the backup files. Now, if you're going to have some sort of HADR technology in place, that can affect your storage choices and how you configure it. So a traditional failover cluster instance, you have to have shared storage. And traditionally, that's been a SAN, but now you can use SMB 3.0 or newer and get good performance and maybe have much lower costs. And even if you're not going to do that, you can, if you have SQL Server 2012 or newer, you can use local storage for TempDB. And that can be a really good scenario there. I've had a lot of customers do that recently with very good results. Now, with always on availability groups, you have to use the Windows clustering feature, but you don't have to use shared storage. So you can have local storage for each one of your availability replicas. And I've seen a lot of people do that since they don't want to deal with the complexity and the cost of the SAN. And it just gives you a lot more flexibility in choosing any kind of storage you want to use. And then anything, you, anything else you might use, such as database mirroring or log shipping, can use any kind of storage you want to. So what I like to do is make sure you don't make a bad mistake of having shared storage and have both sides of a mirror, for example sharing the same SAN. That gives you a single point of failure. And I've seen too many people do that, which is just not a good choice. Now, sizing your storage subsystem. The first thing you want to do is use a RAID calculator to make sure you have enough disk space. And you want to have more than enough disk space because both with magnetic storage and with flash storage, you get an advantage by having lots of available space. Short stroking is an old uh, technique where if you only have a very small portion of your space being used on a magnetic drive, all the data is on the exterior portion of the drive where the disk is spinning somewhat faster, but more importantly, the arm doesn't have to move as much. That's why it's called short stroking, and you get much better performance if you only use a small portion of the drive. You get a similar benefit from flash-based storage for a different reason. So make sure you have enough space, and then after you have space, concentrate on performance. And I always tell people, don't negotiate with yourself. You know, don't say, well, we had a bad quarter last quarter, and we don't have any capital budget, so I'm just going to ask for RAID 5 and magnetic storage. You, know, you should ask for flash-based storage and ask for RAID 10. And then if the budget is forcing you to make compromises, then think about your workload and think about what you want to give up as you start to negotiate. But don't just give away the store without even asking for what you really want. And I always tell people to try to aim for at least 5,000 to 10,000 IOPS on every single LUN. Of course, more is always better. And then when it comes to sequential throughput, I try to get people to get at least one gigabyte per second of sequential throughput on each LUN, because that's going to give you really good performance for your common administrative tasks, such as backing up a database or building an index. And that also comes into play in a disaster recovery situation. If you can restore your big database in a few minutes instead of a few hours, that can be a huge benefit in a DR situation. Now, solid state drives, their access time doesn't depend on any moving parts like magnetic storage does. So your access time is very, very fast and consistent regardless of where the data is located. And having a PCIe storage card, like I talked about earlier, gives you much higher throughput. We're talking anywhere from 2 gigabytes to 7 gigabytes per second. It gets you around that SAS limitation you have with the interface. And they're just really, really good for a random I.O. and anywhere you have an I.O. bottleneck. And we really think that SSDs and flash storage in general are ready for SQL Server usage. They've been around for enough time. We have enough enterprise customers using it that we have confidence in them. And don't make the mistake, well, I'm just going to put tempdb on there, or just to put transaction logs. You want to analyze your system. And anything where you're seeing IO bottlenecks might be a candidate for flash storage. And also, 
some people have gone online and says, well, you know, flash storage is so fast, you don't have to worry about uh, index fragmentation in SQL Server when you have flash storage, and that's not true. You still want to take care of your indexes properly, even if you're using flash storage. Now, magnetic storage versus flash-based storage. Magnetic storage can typically do anywhere between 100 to 200 megabytes per second per disk. And magnetic storage can usually only do about 100 to 200 IOPS per disk. So that's pretty poor compared to what Flash can do. Now Flash, depending on what kind of interface it has, most uh, servers that are out right now still have 6 gigabit per second, but the newest ones have 12 gigabits per second. So 12 gigabits per second with Flash-based storage is about 1,100 megabytes per second per drive. So that's about five times better than magnetic storage, but most servers are still stuck at six gigabits per second. And of course, PCIe storage cards can do much higher than that. And flash-based storage, where it really excels again, is with the random I.O. It's really pretty easy to get almost 100,000 IOPS from a single drive with flash-based storage compared to 200 from a magnetic drive. So here's just some typical metrics you might see from a single drive, a 15K enterprise hard drive versus a, a 400 gigabyte uh, SSD. So you can see the big difference in those metrics there with the latency and the bandwidth and the IOPS. And then traditional magnetic drive performance, here's what it looks like in Crystal Dismark. And you might hear my dogs whining in the background, so I apologize for that. So anyways, Crystal Dismark. This is two drives, 15K drives and RAID 1 on the left. And you can see the sequential throughput on the top line and then the 4K uh, queued up 32 on the bottom. That's pretty low. If you go to the right, you see for six drives and RAID 10. And you can see the numbers going up, but it's still not very good for random I.O. Moving on, you have consumer SSD drive performance. And this is what it looks like for a typical consumer drive. And you can see already that the sequential throughput is about two to three times higher. And then the random throughput is much, much better. It's orders of magnitude better. Here's a first generation Fusion I.O. card. And you can see the numbers there. And you can see that we're going above 550 megabytes per second for sequential reads, because that's the limitation roughly for six gigabit per second SATA. And this is plugged into a PCIe slot. But this is a, about a four or five year old card. And this is a newer card from LSI, a Nitro Warp Drive. And you can see the numbers here. The one thing I want to point out is the difference on the writes with incompressible data on the left versus compressible data on the right. A huge difference. That's because the controller for this card is doing write compression. And if the data is not compressible, then the performance is not going to be what you expect. There's quite a difference there. And then here's just a chart showing the numbers as you go from two magnetic drives to six through the consumer drives, the first generation uh, PCIe cards, and then some newer PCIe cards, how the numbers just get better for sequential performance. And then you'll see the huge difference for random reads and writes. So from 790 IOPS to 98,000 IOPS, it's a huge, huge difference there. So just to review what I've talked about, SQL Server has five primary storage types. We've got internal drives, PCIe flash, direct attached storage, storage area networks, and SMB file shares. You've got different types of SQL Server workloads that are going to affect your I.O. patterns. So you have OLTP workloads and Data Warehouse and OLAP, and then you can have a mixed workload. And you've got to think about what's happening when you do maintenance. So index maintenance, backups, DVCC, check DB, all those are going to put a load on your I.O. system. Then you have the different file types. So you've got your data files, your log files, TempDB, and then backup files, and they have different I.O. workload patterns. And then you need to think about your RAID level and how that affects your performance and also your SLA requirements. And then finally, hopefully you've picked up that I think sequential throughput is important, that it just affects your daily life as a DBA. So making sure you have good sequential throughput is a really important thing to do. So here's a few references. A lot of these are having to do with SMB since it's fairly new to SQL Server. So with that, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them now.
Thank you very much, Len. So much information. Yeah. I'm still trying to keep up. No Any questions? Anyone? Yeah, we have one. Hi, Glenn. Uh, you, you have said that uh, theory, uh, that uh, buffer pool extension is not, uh, we can't benefit from buffer pool exten uh, extension when uh, uh, doing, uh, when working with data warehouse, with big sequential uh, read. Why is right. that? Well, it's unfortunate. It's a, it's a design decision that Microsoft made for the first version of buffer pool extensions. They decided that they're feeling, because I asked them about this during the development cycle, and they said, well, we feel like when you have a large sequential read, it's just going to flush it out, and you get the next one, and it flushes it out, so we're just going to be fighting ourselves if we try to put that in the BPE file, so they purposely don't do it. When you run benchmarks, you see occasionally a very, very small benefit because it does put a little bit of it in the BPE file. But I just wish they had a trace flag or a configuration option where you could say, hey, look, I know that I have a SAN with bad sequential performance, so I'm going to go out and buy some flash storage local and use it for BPE, and I know that's what I'm doing, and let me do it and have SQL Server use that file, but that's not what you can do right now, unfortunately. Thank you. Hey Glenn, um, assuming all those uh, tools you showed us, the uh, third-party tools uh, that uh, measure uh, IOPS and uh, and disk uh, speed, ass assuming I can't uh, I can't uh, run them on production because they uh, they put some load on the, the storage subsystem. So, right. is there any other way I can measure what's my what what to ex expect of my uh, disk throughput? Well, <clears throat> I. I'm not sure if I did a blog post on it. I did a SQL Skills Insider video a few weeks ago. And anyways, there's a query you can run that'll just do a, a table scan or an index scan of a large table. And you can turn on uh, uh, IO stats and time stats when you run the query. And there's a pretty simple calculation you can do. And it'll show you your throughput in you know, megabytes per second for that query. Yeah, but it's affected. Anything you do in production, yeah, anything you do in production is going to affect it. So, I mean, you can do some testing during a maintenance window or do it before you put the system in production. But if it's in production and you try to test it, obviously it's going to have some effect on production. So all you can really do is look at the other metrics to see what your latency is and, and how it's being used. But you can't really stress it as like you would in a benchmark situation. Uh, what I mean that is um, when my system works, any test I'll do will be affected by uh, by what's going on in production. So how can I be sure? Let's see. Let's say if I see some uh, disk uh, read and write latency or any or uh, page I/O latch, uh, how can I be sure that it's uh, the storage subsystem to be blamed or just my um, my workload is too much for the disk? Well, I mean. That's a good question. You can always say, well, if we went in and tuned the query or added an index, it might have a huge effect on how much I.O. is required. So that's one way of looking at it. Or you can say, well, we can just go out and get better storage, and that can fix it. You can throw hardware at the problem, but I don't know it's usually one or the other. And I always try to fight the battle on both fronts. I try to tune the queries and tune the indexes, reduce the I.O., and then at the same time do what I can to make the I.O. work as fast as possible. So I'm not sure if I'm really answering your question, but, you know, there's things you can do to measure what's going on from the I.O. subsystem while you're in production. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, several tools, whether it's uh, Windows built-in tools or the external free tools or your diagnostic uh, DMVs. What is your course of action next time you go to a customer? What do you start? The customer tells you well, a performance problem. What is your methodology for it? Well, usually what I do is I have them run my diagnostic queries, the complete set. And then just by getting those results back, I can tell what's wrong with the system from a configuration point of view and what its biggest performance bottlenecks are. And quite often I have a pretty good idea of how to fix it and make it better just from running my diagnostic queries. But anything else that I can gather, such as the perfmon queries and looking at the SQL Server error log, all that is what I want to look at to try to figure out what's going on. And then ultimately, I want to start looking at the queries and the 
schema of the database and that sort of stuff to see what we can do to tune the workload. Okay, cool. Other questions? One more question. You 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 mentioned that uh, uh, SQL Server workload doesn't benefit or almost uh, doesn't benefit from uh, storage tiering. Why is that? I've never heard about it. Well, what I've found with a lot of people in the field, and I've heard this from some of the vendors, is that depending on how the tier tiering works, it either doesn't react fast enough or it reacts too quickly. So, for example, your hotspots and your SQL Server workload are going to be changing at different times during the day. And for maybe every day at 3 a.m., you start doing index maintenance, which puts certain, you know, a workload on it. So it tries to move stuff for that to a flash. And then later on, you're doing regular workload queries, so it tries to move stuff for that. And depending on how the tiering is working, it doesn't seem to work as well as just doing caching, where you just try to cache data without moving it around from one place to another. It just seems to work better for SQL Server, it's been my experience, to do caching. Thank you. Anyone else? No more questions. Okay, thank you very much, Glenn. All right, thanks everybody for listening and thanks for having me present. Uh, the script and the presentation are available on your blog? Yeah, I'll put them up there. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye.